I've got a what the update. Woo! It's what, what the update. What, 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 what the, the update. What the update. What the update. What not what the update. It's what that update. <laughs> The, the, Oh, I tomato. see. Tomato, tomato, potato, potato. Potato. <laughs> potato. Anyway. Okay. All right. If you want to cast your minds way back in what the history, <laughs> history, hmm, you'll remember that I did a tale about three separate incidents <laughs> involving badgers. <laughs> I love the badgers. <laughs> where uh, the badgers dug up stuff of historical significance. Now, this isn't a badger digging up historically significant stuff, but it's still a badger involved in something historical in that recently at Craig Nethan Castle in Tre- Scotland... Trebs is really sorry if he mispronounced that. I am. Uh, we apologise for more pronunciations later in this podcast. Oh, yeah. Um... Uh, but there was a tunnel at this castle that got closed because a badger had taken up residence. And it was apparently, quote, a very angry badger. It's not clear what the anime did to leave the impression, though, according to the Huffington Post story that I'm looking at right now. Oh, God. How long ago was this? How long did it... Uh, so this was reported okay, um, on the yep, 17th, 17th of April. <laughs> And I love the tagline on this. It says, Very angry badger seizes part of 500-year-old Scottish castle. Followed by, Run away! (laughs) Run away! (laughs) Oh, Uh, God. I've got tears. Oh, I should have. But I I love badgers. And you know what? They are Scotland's largest wild carnivores. mm Mm-hmm. And uh, this badger in particular, who I shall now call the Craig Nathan badger, or badger number four. Badger number four. Uh, <laughs> has since departed, even though the tunnel, as of reporting, was still closed for cleanup. And very messy. Yes. Obviously. Those badgers, they're a bit so, cheeky. <laughs> how, we, we get, how about we get on with our current What the History is? <laughs> yes, we shall. Yay! What the... History, 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 history. Hello and welcome to What the History, your fortnightly bits of bizarre history to make you say What the History. Uh, I am Trevor Holland <laughs> and whispering <laughs> along with me just then <laughs> um, is Susie, Susie Ooh. Holland, that's me everyone, I'm the giggler tonight. Uh, I, I'm finding everything bloody funny tonight, I really am. <laughs> Well, badgers are entertaining, but anyway. Look, I still think of badgers as badger in Wind in the Willows. Okay. Really, I think of him that way. I think of him as a kindly badger. So the scary badgers are a bit foreign to me. Well, I think now it's time to get on with some serious (laughs) history. So what serious history do you have, Susie? I have serious history. I've got really serious history. Are you listening? Yes. This is awesome. <laughs> okay. Serious face. Getting into the zone. They can't see your head movements. They can't see my head. Oh, that's right. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm, serious time. Ow. <laughs> now, we've all heard about football rights, baseball rights. Now, see the previous podcast, Disco Inferno, for that one, because it's one of my favourites. And I think it was closely linked to the Badger one. It was the same episode. I think it was the same episode. See how we've linked that in? Yes. It's really cool. Okay, now, and also rights between people who are generally not liking each other, obviously. <laughs> it's the latter that has something to do with my latest foray into the what the universe. What could be the reason that people would write over all things of pieces of clothing? Listen on, dear what the historian. Listen on, as sometimes the clothes. The maketh the man can also maketh the story. Mm. Wow, that was pretty deep. Anyway, the first item of clothing that I would like to tell you about is the humble top hat. Yes, the top hat. When this dapper hat was created and paraded by haberdasher John Hetherington of the Strand in 1797, that's in London, it caused such a commotion of the not-so-good kind where women fainted, children screamed, and dogs yelped at the sight of John and his hat. My word. My word. A newspaper article in the Huddersfield Chronicle 
on 16th of January, 1797, went so far as to say, and I quote, <laughs> this is great, Mr. Hetherington, who was well connected, appeared on the public highway wearing upon his head what he called a silk hat, a tall structure having a shiny luster and calculated to frighten timid people, end quote. <laughs> This occurred the day before on the 15th and John was brought before the court where his hat was actually produced as evidence on the 16th and he was ordered to pay £500 in damages as in the ensuing melee a boy was thrown to the ground and he had his arm broken, unfortunately. In his defence, John advised the court that he hadn't broken any law. He was exercising his right as an Englishman to wear upon his head a design of his own making. The top hat was banned after that, funny enough, but came into vogue 50 years later, thanks to Prince Albert, consort of Queen Victoria. And it caught on in the United States thanks to Abraham Lincoln, Mr Moneybags from Monopoly and, of course, Uncle Sam. The next item of clothing didn't cause the same kind of ruckus, but a riot nonetheless. This time crowds of young men armed with clubs, some with nails in the end, were protesting against the humble straw hat. Yes. In September 1922, hundreds of these men terrorised Manhattan, being violent with anyone they saw wearing a straw hat after September 15th which was the end of the straw hat wearing season. Now, I had no idea there were different seasons to wear hats, but anyway, I'll continue. Magistrate Peter Hatting, and I kid you not, advised the thugs that anyone can wear a straw hat in, and I quote, a January snowstorm if he wishes, end quote. The hat-hating crowds disagreed with dozens of people injured and a great number of broken and disheveled straw hats were strewn in the streets and burned on bonfires. Many fines and court cases soon followed. Funny enough, only eight years earlier in Bridgetown, New Jersey, pulling the hats off unsuspecting people occurred as the end of straw hat season was September the 1st and was done as a fraternity prank to begin with and the straw hat loving folk began to fight back. The fire and the police departments were called to quell the riots with many hauled before the courts for wearing a straw hat. But out of season. Out of season, oh my Good goodness. Good lord. What is this world coming to? Okay, the next story involves a riot at a Parisian fashion show in 1911 when two rival fashion houses launched trouser skirts to allow for greater movement and flexibility for the modern woman. Both houses chose to show their own versions of trouser skirts at the beginning of the race season and they were met with disgust but with no violence. And that came later. The two models happily modelled their new creations at the Palace d'Opera, and that's when the rioting began. In the melee, with a crowd displeased at the new style, the models were harassed by a mob who destroyed their hats, pulled their hair, and reduced the poor girls to tears. The models needed to be removed by a number of policemen on bicycles to get them to safety. Oh dear. Mm. <laughs> And again, the hat's got it. And the hat's copped it again. God, there's no end to this hat abuse, mm. I tell you. Okay, and on that note, the last story I will bring you is a right slash heated argument that took place in Australia in 2009. That long ago? Yes, heady times, with its origins not being about clothing, but rather a lack of it. At a North Queensland clothing optional resort, a nudist party was in full swing when a guest refused to remove his clothes, causing a mini-riot when three naked women demanded that, as they were naked, he needed to be naked as well, and the guest refused, causing arguments, and I quote, argy-bargy, <laughs> end quote, ensued. The owner got involved, told the guest to disrobe, and told the guest they were being disrespectful for being clothed, and again they refused, and needed to be es escorted off the premises by police. Oh dear. Mm, but were their hats okay? I'm sure their hats were okay. Okay. I I'm sure. I'm, I'm actually really hoping that they put their hats in a safe place. Mm. Like under a tree or something. Yeah. I was going to say under a bush, but I think that was a bit bad. <laughs> no, no, not a good one there. But yeah, you know, some people actually tend to wear many hats. 
throughout life. Yes, they do, don't they? And clothing of a huge variety of things and in different ways this... and of different representations. What a beautiful segue. Do you come up with this all by yourself, at, like on the spur of the moment? or it... Yeah, pretty much. That's why most oh, of them are so Oh, look, labeled. give him a hand, everyone. Give him a hand. That's I pretty damn cool. Didn't think that was that good, but anyway. I thought it was great, but please continue. Yes. So, history books have an... Oh, by the way, before I start, I do apologise for any pronunciations mm -hmm. of names, places, or words in this following story. I'm not very good with Spanish. Mm. Oh. History books have many tales of young individuals defying expectations and heading out on a life of, of adventure and discovery. Young men and women breaking out of societal expectations and forging their own paths. And sometimes such individuals can push out so far it can be hard to tell the difference between fact and fiction. Such is the case with Catalina de Arasso. Now, I will preface this with a quick note about pronouns in the following story. Most of this is taken straight from de Arasso's autobiography, where Catalina tended to use whatever pronoun was best suited at the time. Um, I'm hoping this will make, soon, make sense soon, so please trust me on this. Born to a noble family in San Sebastian, Spain in 1585, or maybe 1592, depending if you were checking her autobiography or the baptismal records, uh, Catalina ended up being sent to a convent run by her aunt when she was just four years old. From a very early point in her life, Catalina shrugged off ladylike trappings and instead expressed a desire to be more like her father, who was an officer in the Spanish army. This was unheard of at the time, and her increasingly uncouth manner and rebellious nature made her parents despair about marrying her off. They ended up deciding she would instead be sent off to a monastery to lead her life as a nun. Catalina decided not to have a bar of this, and at the age of 15 managed to escape from the convent, and with a drastically altered haircut and substantial change of clothing, Catalina became Francisco de Loyola, a young boy out to make his fortune. This was a very risky disguise, as at the time, cross-dressing was illegal in Spain and could have very serious consequences. It wasn't long before Catalina was tested. Seeking employment, he, as per the autobiography, found employment with a doctor who was married to one of his relatives. The doctor attempted to molest Catalina, who avoided the advances and left very quickly but did take enough time to clear out the doctor's cash reserves first. Yay! Shortly after, he came across his father, who was searching for his missing daughter. Catalina's disguise held, and he continued on his adventure, which also included spending time in a men's prison after getting into a series of fights. I like this girl. Mm. Well, boy, at this point boy. in time. According person. to Catalina. I, I like this person. According to Catalina. Mm -hmm. Now, Catalina returned to San Sebastian and deliberately interacted with his family before heading off to America to seek his fortune as a sailor on a ship, captain by a friend of his mother. <laughs> Get this. Now things start getting really out there. After a series of swashbuckling adventures showing that Catalina was good in the fight, he ended up finding employment in Peru, where he soon became very popular with his employer, and his employer's mistress. After an altercation at a theatre ended up in a fight, Catalina slashed the face of a young man who was the mistress's nephew. In an effort to settle things down, his employer gave Catalina two options. Either marry the mistress, which would also give the mistress a more respectable reason to be hanging around, or leave town. The mistress was reportedly very keen on the prospect of marrying this dashing young fellow, However, Catalina chose the second option and fled. The nephew had other plans. He, along with two friends, tracked Catalina down to Trujillo and intended to teach him the error of his ways. In the ensuing fight, Catalina killed one of the friends and drove the others off. Catalina was jailed for the killing and was only released at the insistence of his former employer. Later, while managing a shop in Lima, 
Catalina found some more trouble, this time of his own devising. His boss found him in an amorous embrace with his sister-in-law, where Catalina had his hand caressing down between her legs. Oh, bless. Catalina was fired and he decided on a change of pace, so he joined the army. (laughs) Catalina proved to be a very capable, yet very vicious soldier, and ended up serving under his brother Miguel de Arasso. Miguel didn't recognise this brutally efficient fighting machine, but was impressed by what he saw. Catalina rose in ranks to second lieutenant before his vicious techno-prisoner's attitude got the better of him. After taking command of a company after his captain was killed, Catalina led an assault that resulted in the death of an enemy leader who the army had been ordered to take alive. Catalina was suspended from duty on half pay. With not much else to do, Catalina took up the very wholesome habits of drinking and brawling, almost killing one of his opponents. Rather than face more possible jail time, he chose to flee to a monastery to seek sanctuary. He was there for six months until a fellow soldier asked him to be his second in a duel. The duel took place in a dark alley, and Catalina soon got into a fight with the other participant's second, and killed him in the ensuing melee. The unfortunate casualty turned out to be Miguel de Arasso, and Catalina promptly fled back to the monastery. After killing his brother, Catalina deserted the army and sent out with some others into the mountains where his party nearly all died from starvation. Catalina only survived after being saved by a Native American woman. In return for being nursed back to health, Catalina was asked to marry the woman's daughter. Catalina agreed to avoid trouble, but while arrangements were being made, he started wooing the daughter of a town official and ended up proposing to her as well. He didn't get through with either marriage, though. Instead, he stole both dairies and fled town. Now, (laughs) Catalina's ensuing adventures, according to his autobiography, included working as a bounty hunter, being a con man, a highwayman, and basically an all-round Lothario. Tales of fleeing from jealous husbands and the hangman's noose abound, until, with wanted posters peppering the land, Catalina again took refuge in a church. At this point, the autobiography changes to Catalina referring to herself as a woman as she knelt before the Bishop Francisco Verdugo Cabrera and confessed with, and I quote, Sir, all this I have told your lordship is not so. The truth is this, that I am a woman, that I was born in such and such a place, daughter of such and such a man or woman, that I was placed in a certain age in such and such a convent with my aunt so-and-so, that I grew up there, took the habit, and became a novice, that about to take vows, I ran off, that I went to such and such a place, stripped, dressed myself as a man, cut off my hair, travelled here and there, went to sea, roamed, hustled, corrupted, maimed, and murdered, until coming to end up here at his lordship's feet. End quote. Oh, that's hard to say. The stunned bishop handed Catalina over to a couple of midwives so they could test her story and, well, her virtue. The confirmation that she was a virgin and was therefore still respectable and pure in the eyes of the church meant she was saved from any consequences of her years of cross-dressing and now, cloaked in a nun's habit, she became something of a local celebrity. She still refused to enter a convent, and once they had confirmed she had never actually taken vows, she was allowed to leave the church. Upon returning to Spain, Catalina petitioned to receive a pension for her service in the army. She eventually obtained it after, according to her, she had an audience with Pope Urban VIII, who was so impressed by her story, except the murdering parts, (laughs) that he gave her a papal exemption from the cross-dressing laws. She dictated her autobiography, The Lieutenant Nun, before living out the rest of her life wearing men's attire, still getting up to all sorts of adventures. I would go into more detail, but it would take many more episodes of What the History to fully cover her exploits and antics. Wow. Yeah. She... they... (laughs) Well... Sound absolutely brilliant. 
Catalina did Except end her the, life as a except the murdering part. Woman. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> oh gosh, so many things they did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was, started looking at the story, just sort of going, "What is what? This, this is amazing?" <laughs> I mean, again, most of the sources do come directly from Catalina's autobiography, so. Some may be embellished, but there's no <laughs> real way of knowing for sure. No. So pretty much had to take most of it at face value, which oh, is just bless. like a very stunned face going, she did, he did what? Where? How? Who? What? With who? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Beautiful. I hope you enjoyed this episode <laughs> of What the History. <laughs> now, uh... <laughs> If you did enjoy it and if you want to get in touch with us, it's super duper easy. Uh, you can find our Facebook page, What the History on Facebook. Yes, uh, like us. We like you. Absolutely. You can find <laughs> us on Twitter at pod underscore what to get updates of the of, of our podcast. Or you can search for hashtag WTHpod. You can send us an email to WTHpod at rufusproject.com. Or you can even head to our homepage wthbot.rufusproject.com where you can leave comments below this episode and you will also find all our references for the stuff we have discussed this That's evening. Right. We do have references and they're good references. Mm, they certainly they're are. They're not Wikipedia. And uh, anyone, who <laughs> listens, anyone who listens to The Rufus Project will know that I, I mentioned that uh, Christian's taking a little bit of a break. So uh, a little sneak peek. What the History is going to take over an episode of the Rufus Project. Oh, so, I am excited. Yeah, so stay tuned. Excited um, is excited. <laughs> definitely follow either the Rufus Project or What the History on Facebook for more details very soon. Mm, you'll see what happens when we take over. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> admittedly, I'm one of the hosts of the Rufus Project. Yeah. So, But still, as far as I'm concerned, it's the What the History takeover. We're taking over everything. It's ours. It's all ours. <laughs> and on that note, uh, we will be back in a couple of weeks' time with two more bizarre bits of history to make you say, What, what the history? history? <laughs> Good night, everyone. See you later. <laughs>